So, we went from that point, we went to uh, having created the definitions of the 16 variables of harm. We then went to do the analysis of these using this uh, MCDA drug model. ISCD was the charity I set up when I was sacked by the government Independent Scientific Committee on Drugs. It's now called Drug Science. And decision conferencing is a relatively new um, process. It's been around about 30 years, invented by these, uh, these economists, and uh, uh, it's become now the standard way of dealing with very big, complicated questions, like what to do with nuclear waste. The British government used this approach over two years in public consultations to decide what to do with nuclear waste. And it works uh, to help you deal with this kind of problem. So this is a, a, real, <laughs> a real place. It, Gold Hill exists, and you can see Gold Hill is it, it's, uh, was built in 1859. It's got an elevation of 8,453 feet and a population of 118. And the total is very helpfully displayed there. <laughs> and it does show that someone could add up, but beyond that, it doesn't actually contribute a great, great deal to our understanding of what goes on in that town. And the point about MCDA, and, and this is the crucial, critical aspect, it allows us to compare, in the case of drugs, harms which occur in such different aspects of life that the metrics are fundamentally different. So you're going from the economic metric, pounds lost, or the cost of, of drug-related behavior, to a completely separate measure, say, likelihood of dying. But MCDA allows us to do that, and it does it by creating a, a value tree. People, you just make decisions on, the, on relative value, or in the case of drugs, the, the negative value of the different harms that drugs can produce. And I'll explain it in a bit more detail how you do it. So we started off, we took the tw these 20 drugs, some of them legal, some of them illegal, some of them new, some of them old. Uh, and we had a second conference, and again, this is a complicated process. You get an expert group together. You, you have to spend a day and then a half, two days doing it. And what you have to do is you have to take all those 20 drugs, and you have to rank them on each of those 16 parameters of harm. And each parameter is scaled on a, a 0 to 100 scale. And the critical approach is to decide which is the most harmful drug on each of those 18, 16 parameters of harm. And you put that at the top. The most harmful drug scores 100. And then you scale all the other drugs in relation to that as a ratio of harm. So a drug which is half as harmful as the most harmful drug scores 50. A drug which is a tenth as harmful scores 10. A hundredth as harmful scores one. So you create this uh, list of 20 ratios on that scale. And then you do it for all the other parameters of harm. So this essentially tells you, and I'm sorry it's all so corrupted, but you, you've hear, heard what I said, it's all pretty straightforward. Everything is a ratio scale. And the great thing is then you have 16 ratio scales. And ratio scales can be compared because they're ratios. They're not absolute numbers. Let me give an example that uh, will make perhaps a little more sense of it if you're a bit confused. So here we have two separate measures of harm. On the left hand, we have drug-specific mortality, the likelihood of the drug killing you when you first use it or any time you use it. And on the right hand, the uh, likelihood of the drug killing you over repeated use. Just look at the two arrows on the left hand side. The red arrow is heroin, the blue arrow is tobacco. Heroin is the most drug most likely to kill you if you any time you take it, you're most like it's the one that's most likely to kill you. Tobacco doesn't score at all. As far as we know, no one's ever died from their first cigarette. But on the right hand side, the likelihood of dying as a result of using the drug chronically 
you see that heroin is still there as number one, but tobacco has moved up to number two because we know that at least half of all smokers die of a smoking-related disorder. So that shows you uh, yeah, that's one example of how each of these, these rankings work. So then you end up with these, uh, these 16 sets of rankings. But then you go to the next stage, and the next stage is weighting them. Because it may be that they're not all equally relevant. In fact, it's very unlikely that they all would be relevant. And weighting is something that has to be done, again, by consensus. All this is done in an open discussion by the Delphic method. Everyone says what they think. People defend any outlying positions. A consensus is reached. So then you have to get a consensus on what, how you would weight each of these different criteria. Which do you care most about? And In essence, this is done by looking at the difference between the, the, the worst and the, the least harmful drug on each one of those 16 parameters of harm and deciding how much you care about that. And what you do is decide which of those parameters you care about the most, and then you scale all the others to, uh, as a, a proportion, a ratio of that score. So let me give you an example. Let's look at the six of the harms to other people. So on the top, along the top there, you see the drugs which we thought were most harmful in these variables. This is crime, social damage, family adversity, economic damage, da, da, da. Okay? And at the bottom, you see the drugs which we thought were least relevant to those, but that's kind of irrelevant because it's the difference between the top and bottom that matters. And then you see it in the... Uh, the very bottom row, you see some numbers. And you see for economic cost, in the column economic cost, there's a score of 100. And that's because our group thought that the economic cost of alcohol, compared with, in this case, I think, mephedrone, was the most important of those six variables. We cared more about that than anything else. And then we scaled each of those other parameters in relation to how much we cared about the economic cost of alcohol. And you can see the numbers. Some of them, you know, crime, I think, there at 80. Um, the next one along, family adversity or whatever, at 70. So, but you can see how each of those was separately scored. And then what you do is, using those ratios, you work down the, the decision tree and, and rescale all the scoring according to the weighting. And it turns out in the end that there, there are a number of the parameters which contribute ma most to the final outcomes. These are, e this is uh, physical dam eco eco economics at the top, then physical damage, and then uh, the next two down, social damage, etc. They contribute over half of all the uh, harms uh, that you see across the 16 different variables. Now, it's really important to know that weighting is something that is done by that group, and it could be done by a different group. I've tried to get politicians to do this. They've refused, because it would actually expose them to having to deal with facts about drugs. But uh, the weighting is, is Obviously, it's, it's group-specific, it's probably cultural-specific, and it's probably also um, got something to do with uh, you know, what kind of professional groups you're in as well. It's important, though, because, as I say, not each of those parameters should be seen as being equally important. And what we've seen in the history of drug decision-making is that maybe just a single parameter yeah, could, be, could be used to make a drug illegal and seriously controlled. And MCDA is without question the most powerful way of assessing something like drug harms, but it's also the most powerful way of understanding what you know about any topic. It's, I think it's a really, it's an extraordinary uh, effective way of getting to understand anything you're trying to do. Disassemble it, it into the different elements and then in a Delphic group work out what you actually care, what you know about, and what you care about. And then from that, 
we came up with this drug ranking, which you saw uh, this morning. And to my surprise, because alcohol had been only fourth in the previous nine-point scale, alcohol came out as the most harmful in the UK. And that's because of the size of the red bar. The red bar is a, is a scale. The ratio of the red bars is a ratio of the harm that each of those drugs does to other people. And alcohol is the most harmful drug to other people because it's widely used and it's got such huge economic costs and uh, costs in terms of personal violence, social violence, uh, health care costs, etc. It's not the most harmful drug to the user. If you go to the right of alcohol, you see the blue bars are, are bigger for heroin, crystal meth, etc. But overall, alcohol is the most harmful drug in the UK. And that's why uh, I was arguing that we should focus our attempts uh, at dealing with harm on alcohol, because it's the most harmful drug. But governments don't want to do that. Governments want to focus on the drugs on the right, where there's very little evidence of social harm at all, and less evidence of personal harm. And of course, the reason they choose to do that is because the drinks industry is one of the most powerful and effective lobbying industries there's ever been, perhaps second only to the defense industry. So that was published. It got quite a lot of, well, got a lot of airtime, got a lot of criticism. The tobacco activists said it's rubbish because tobacco is the most, kills more people than anything else. And I, one wouldn't dispute that. But the people it kills are old people, and it kills them before you have to pay them a pension, so that's good. So, you know, there are different parameters in which you have to, you have to view things rather differently. And uh, other people said, well, that's just a group of nuts cronies getting together to do what, it, what, uh, what he tells them. Well, I can assure you they don't do what I tell them. There's one in the room, she's going to be sitting up here in a minute, Val Curran. And she's never done what I've told her, nor has Fiona Misham. In fact, none of my group ever do what I tell them. They, all, they challenge me viciously. But anyway, that's a fair criticism. Is it just a group of elite British scientists coming to these decisions? Well, interestingly, about two years after we published this, the Director General of the um, Justice Department in the European Commission approached us and said, we would like you to do the same using European experts. So we convened a meeting, we, uh, 30 European experts from 20 different European countries, a two-day meeting, they went through the same 20 drugs, they looked at the ratios, the ranking on each of those 16 uh, criteria, they changed every single one of them. And then we got to the weightings, and they changed every single one of them. And the final result was identical. None of you can see what's different between that and the previous one, apart from the colouring. One drug, two drugs changed. GHB and ketamine swapped places in the middle. But overall, the correlation between the UK experts and the European experts was 0.995, which for this kind of uh, what you might call social scientific exercise is unprecedented. And it tells us this is an extremely robust process. And it's, uh, it's a process which I think you can translate anywhere in the world. And we did. St. Vincent's last year convened uh, a decision conference for Australian experts to do exactly the same thing. Uh, they didn't do it on all exactly the same drugs, because apparently you have the use of things we don't call drugs in Britain, things like petrol. But So we had to remove some of our drugs and put some of your drugs in. But we did it. And Yvonne here is going to tell you about the results a little bit later, either today or sometime in the next month or so. But the paper is now in press, and she will make an announcement about that. <laughs>